So today's talk is From Voodoo to Vigilance, The Evolution of Research on Stress and Heart Disease by Dr. John Ruiz. And just a friendly reminder about Francis McClellan Institute, even though I think you guys know who we are and what we do, but we're all about bringing high quality research to bear on the important issues facing children, youth, and families today. And if you haven't already, check out our website. We've been doing, working our best to update everything. And we're also on Facebook and on Twitter. And if we ever put up your picture um, on Facebook, if you like our page, we can also tag you. So then you can also promote whatever pictures or videos or promotion kind of thing we're doing about your research or your awards. And just another shout out to Pamela Turbeville. A big thank you for supporting the speaker series and supporting the research and the teaching we do um, in family and consumer sciences here at UVA. And I think you guys know a little bit about her already. She's one of our esteemed alumni, graduated from UVA in 1972. And so today we are very lucky to have Dr. John Ruiz with us. He comes from the Department of Psychology and he just joined the UVA. Um, this fall in 2015, so we're happy to feature his research and for all of you to get to know him and all the exciting things that he's bringing to U of A and what he's doing. His background is in clinical psych with a focus on health specialty. He's been looking at things like the Latino health paradox and health disparities, and today, particularly, he's going to focus on his research on stress and heart disease. And he's had um, already some NIH funding for the work that he's been doing and affiliated with several other NIH health uh, working groups. So he's a good person to talk to about anything within that realm. And he assured me that he has an open door policy. So I think you guys should test it out. So <laughs> an email, uh, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Paul. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. I brought my glasses. I'm this close. I, I shouldn't need them, but if I feel like I'm not doing very good, I'll put them on to think more. I saw a lecture on this recently. <laughs> so then about heavy clipboards, if, you, if your clipboard's weighted enough, then people feel like questionnaires on it are more valuable. Mm -hmm. And if you wear glasses, then it tends to bump things up a notch. So <laughs> no, I got my props. I'll hand out clipboards. So those are nice for you. Don't forget if you spill coffee on yourself, we'll like you better. <laughs> <laughs> My children spill all kinds of things on me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we won't actually be doing any food today. It's just something to talk about. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a nice introduction. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do I do a couple of different things here. Um, I have a what I'll call my basic stress uh, research, and that's I'll talk about some of that uh, work in, in the larger talk today. Um, I, I probably won't get into uh, the Latino health stuff, but if you're interested in that, uh, you can always just give me a shout, and, and I'm happy to talk to you about those things as well. Uh, and, and Andrea and I have some connections. We're uh, we work on the same journal, uh, and I didn't actually realize that she was here until, um, oh, just not uh, until a few months ago, uh, and we started making connections, and, and I, I saw it like on her email, I was like, that's an Arizona address, and, and so it's, it's nice that the, the world is small and we all, we all come together. Um, so, voodoo, yeah, voodoo death is basically the idea um, that your perceptions uh, can kill you, um, which is, sounds awfully frightening. I feel like I have enough to worry about in a general day. Um, uh, just trying to, I, I've been very concerned about the, uh, the tracks outside uh, when the little train runs. I wasn't sure if I could touch them or not. Uh, so I've been hopping over them like a, like a, like a, you know, like an adolescent deer or something like that. Uh, and then finally some students stop me and they're like, you know, you can touch those. <laughs> um, but this is the idea that, that your perceptions can kill you. And it sounds like a ridiculous kind of notion. Like, you know, if you, if you have these thoughts, could that really happen? Um, but there's this. Uh, Walter Cannon, who's, you know, if there was ever sort of a Mount Rushmore of stress researchers, um, like Osler, and there'd be Cannon, he'd be right there. Um, and apparently he wrote those back uh, before H's were invented, because you can see up here that there's no H in anthropologist. Um, but 
he, he gathered this paper that has probably a top five little title, uh, and it's Voodoo Death. Um, and in it, he recounts a number of episodes that have been documented in other places. He brings them all together, uh, and he writes, um, he quotes uh, Herbert Bastow and says, the man who discovers that he is being boned by any enemy, and, and I think they're, they're literally talking about pointing a bone at somebody. You have a bone that pointed at you, and that's apparently a bad thing in some places. Um, so the man who discovers that he is being boned by an enemy is indeed a pitiable, uh, a, a pitiable sight. His cheeks blanch, his eyes become glassy, and expression on his face becomes horribly distorted. He attempts to shriek, but usually the sound chokes in his throat. He sways backward and falls to the ground, and after a short time, appears to swoon. Uh, unless help is forthcoming in the shape of a counter charm, his death is only a matter of a comparatively short time. And on the surface, it sounds like a cool kind of novel you might want to read, um, something to put on your tablet kind of thing. Um, but he documents these, and he gathers them up um, from sources essentially around the world. The same phenomena over and over and over, uh, all documenting this idea. And while we might say, well, that's just ridiculous, you know, how can you tell somebody else, you know, I'm cursing you and, and you're going to die, and then they, they actually die. It sounds, it's hard, it's hard to sort of, in an age of science, it's hard to fathom that idea. But there's contemporary examples of it as well. Um, earthquakes. If you go into PubMed, Medline, you can do a search on earthquakes and uh, um, myocardial infarction, heart attacks, and you come up with a, an amazing list that read much like the voodoo death paper. Same sort of phenomenon, scary experience, people just falling down all over the place, uh, many of them dying. Um, after September 11th, um, across the, the New York area, uh, uh, heart attacks um, just going through the roof two, three, four times what they were in the months uh, of preceding years. Um, and other natural disasters, uh, whether it's the Boston bombing or, or other kinds of events. Um, this is a phenomenon that we continue to see. And so, at the end of his paper, Can offers, uh, or posits the following. The suggestion which I offer, therefore, is that voodoo death may be real and it may be explained as due to shocking emotional stress, to obvious or repressed terror. And I think even that last part is, 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 is quite interesting. Um, because essentially what he's saying is, is it's not necessarily an overt, clear source. It can sometimes just simply be in your mind. Nowadays, we don't really don't go around studying voodoo death. I wouldn't put voodoo death on my CV. That's something that, you know, I have an expertise in voodoo death. Um, it, it'd be interesting if people would stop and look at that. Um, but nowadays, we call this stress. We talk a lot about stress. Um, so today I thought I'd, I'd sort of take this opportunity, um, and I don't know if this was the intent of the original talk, but I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of history of stress research and, and the evolution of, of stress research uh, as it relates particularly to heart disease as a sort of unifying outcome. Uh, and within that, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of um, uh, methodologies, of technology, and how these things come together to both inform and motivate the other and lead us to um, really starting to ask and be able to measure and address more ecologically valid kinds of um, phenomena. Uh, near the end of that, I'll talk about some of my current work in the area of vigilance. Um, I think that I'm particularly fortunate to be in a time right now when the methodologies have come together in a way that this is a phenomenon that we can now investigate um, in a way that wasn't really possible. It took me all day to do that, by the way, that was transition. <laughs> um, stress. If you ask people, you know, are you stressed, on a college campus like this, the answer is invariably yes, and then you have to get into degrees of stress. And so you can all think about it. Have you, have you had any stress today? Right? And everyone, <laughs> I like that. You, know, you go with a 10 back there already. Um, but, but stress is, it, it feels like a contemporary modern problem. And you can think about the things in your day, simply even today, that have caused you stress. Maybe it was your car. Maybe it was the line at Starbucks. Maybe it was finding the room. Maybe it was 
Uh, I don't know, there's just any number of things. The phone call, the, the, the people in your household, the people you hold dearest um, can sometimes be your greatest source of stress. Stress is, to us, at least, a very contemporary, a very modern phenomenon. We think well, maybe people are more stressed today than they've ever been before. But of course, it's probably not the case. I'm sure that you know, cavemen and whatnot used to get stressed about other things. Um, our current stressors are just a little bit different, uh, the source of them, but probably not the magnitude uh, or the frequency. Stress research has evolved over time. Early stress research focused on events. And so we have measures like what we'll call the life events scale. And, and they said each stressor has an inherent stress, each, each of these events has an inherent stress value. And at the very top was death of a spouse. That the death of the spouse is a, is a uh, universal top threat for, for everyone. It's, it's the number one stressor. Uh, divorce was number two, uh, marriage was uh, number five, um, uh, pregnancy uh, is on there. It's not only you know, what we might consider bad things, but good things as well can be stressful. And so a lot of the early stress research didn't talk about stress per se, but talked about these kinds of events. So you can go into PubMed, and you might not be impressed with the number of citations that you see when you type in stress or perceived stress. But if you look up the individual events, you'll find tons of things out there that fall under this larger umbrella. In the 80s, stress went sort of from being a specific event to more of an individual difference in how we process information. So for example, who here has been in this room before? Most of you. Are you sitting in the, your usual spot? Do you have a spot? No. If you look at the undergrads at the university, and when they walk into your class, invariably they always sit in the same spots. And if somebody is in their spot, some get very upset, others let it go. We have individual debate. It's not really like a, like, it's not on the stressful life of that scale, right? It's not number 83, someone's in my spot in Canada, right? It's not on there. Rather, it's a difference in how we appraise a situation, what we think about it. And those appraisals can vary day to day. Some days you may not care that somebody's sitting in your spot. Other days when everything has gone wrong, you're quite upset, that's a big deal. It's just it's the last thing you needed on that particular day. And so stress became more of a sort of a state viable sort of concept uh, in the 80s. Much more about how you wander your environment and how you evaluate your environment. So, and in addition then, we also have a sort of third and fourth sort of set of measures that are used to sort of identify stress. One is something like a perceived stress scale. Some of you may have uh, experience with this. Um, it asks a lot of affect questions. You know, how, how distressed have you been in the last week? How much did you cry in the last week? How angry were you in the last week? How anxious were you in the last week? And it, it aggregates those experiences together to create essentially a number of proxy indicators of a latent construct of stress. Uh, and then there's also specific negative affect measures. When we talk about anxiety, well, anxiety must be due to some underlying stressful uh, event. Regardless of which of those you use, the literature is fairly clear that we have some fairly strong associations between our various stress constructs and just about every kind of health problem you can imagine. Uh, eating disorders, metabolic problems, asthma, cancer, heart disease, memory problems, cold, migraine, diarrhea, everything. Just jump to there, because death is in there too. And there's a lot of this data. Again, you might have to go and look up the specific events, like divorce. You might have to go look up anxiety. But it's there, and it's a fair, if you, if you aggregate it all together, the data, paints a fairly uh, a low variance range picture. Uh, the resolution is coming in fairly clear that there's an association. But does stress actually cause disease? That's a different question. It's associated with disease, but does it actually cause disease? There's you could do a talk like this in a number of ways. And the way I sort of see these things, there's two basic lines of research that really speak to the causality question. Uh, the first is what we'll 
So to generally turn the non-human primate model of research, um, uh, this was stuff done in the early 80s, largely by uh, uh, Kaplan and Manick. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a moment. The second set is essentially well-designed prospective human study, um, where you have a person and then you follow them for a period of time. You do these in large numbers of studies, large numbers of participants, and it paints a general picture. The, the non-primate model, and how many of you are familiar with this work? There's a couple people. This is, this is it's, it's a little in our history now, in, in sort of the health field, but it doesn't, it doesn't negate its, its sort of value to how we understand the question. Um, this comes out of the Bowman Gray Medical School. Uh, and essentially what they did is they had uh, small troops of monkeys. Um, these were synologous macaques. You can imagine, imagine if you're holding a basketball, everybody hold a basketball if you don't mind. It's a, it's, it's a basketball-sized monkey. Uh, it's about that big. Uh, it's fairly ferocious, so don't hold it too close. Um, uh, it has a tail, if you're wondering. Um, uh, but they're, but they're, they're largely social animals, and they arrange themselves in dominance hierarchies. And so when we first put them together, they generally have a sort of an establishment bout. This is uh, sort of like cage fighting for two or three days. It can be fairly brutal. Um, but they establish themselves in, in, in a dominance hierarchy, and usually things are fairly easy after that. Um, in this particular study, all the animals were uh, fed an athrogenic diet. They were fed something called monkey chows. I think it's made, actually made by Karina. Um, but it was a constant diet, so you're able to control the food intake and then the caloric intake of the entire sample. They were then housed in small groups, four to five uh, monkeys per group. Um, and but before, before that, that dispersement, they were then uh, randomized to, to one of two conditions, either um, to stable groupings, um, which were considered the low stress group. And the stable groupings were they, their, they put their initial groups together. You can think of like move-in day for like freshmen uh, into the dorms. They move in, right? It's just sort of feeling out here. It's a couple of stressful days. Um, and then things are stable for the rest of the year. That's essentially what that group was. They, they came together, there was some stress. They had their establishment about, and then everybody was good to go for the duration of the study. In unstable groupings, the, the groups were switched and recalibrated um, on a monthly basis. So every month, everybody got new groupings, and they would go through their establishment about once again. And this was considered the high stress group. It was much more unstable, it was a lot more um, chaos. And, and so that was that was the, that was really the only difference between your groups. Otherwise, they were everything else is, is nice and controlled. Uh, it's a classic experimental design. Um, after three years, the animals were sacrificed, which means what it means. Um, but it allowed for an objective analysis of different group differences in disease status. Just how much disease is in the arteries of the stable group versus the and what they found is that the high-stress animals, the ones in the unstable groupings, had significantly more objectively measured disease than the more stable groupings. Uh, it was a replicable finding, um, and at this, at this point you could say this is a, a fairly tight manipulation um, with a very clear outcome where everything else was really meticulously controlled gives us some pretty strong evidence that this is, in fact, a causal process. Of course, you can't do that with people. Um, and, and so we have a different kind of set of studies. And these are more uh, prospective longitudinal studies, where you watch people over a period of time. Um, and what they find in these studies is that, regardless of your measure of stress, whatever you're using, that the evidence is, 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 is fairly strong, in fact, it's, it's, been, it's quite consistent, um, that stress is uh, associated with risk factors for heart disease. So more smoking, more um, uh, high lipids due to diet and, and exercise differences, um, that it's uh, associated with the development of heart disease uh, in otherwise healthy populations. So folks come in at time one, they get a checkup, they're, they're free of heart disease, um, over time, those with higher stress levels are more likely to develop uh, the clinical indicators of heart disease. 
Um, you can look at, uh, much now that this technology is developed, you can look at subclinical disease. Um, you can look into a person now and see how much plaque is built up into their arteries. You can look at things like uh, intimate media thickness. You can use ultrasounds to detect these things. Yeah. Uh, calcium scanners now. Uh, and that evidence is that not only do people with higher stress have more of that disease, but it's also progressing at a faster rate than those who have less stress. And finally, there's some, some very compelling work showing that those under high stress are far more likely to develop uh, clinical manifestations of heart disease, things like heart attacks um, than other groups. You'll notice that some of these journals um, are, are probably uh, familiar to you, American Journal of Cardiology, uh, Psychosomatic Medicine, Health Psychology, very high tier journals, uh, and there's even some journals like Lancet up there. And if you know your journals, if you know the difference between these journals, Lancet's really, it's just one of your top medical journals. And they tend not to publish a lot of psychosocial research. But they're publishing this stuff because it's, when it's science and science, and, and we can't sort of form an alternate explanation to the data, at some point it's fairly convincing. And so you're seeing publications in even those kinds of outlets. I do want to talk about the interheart study for a moment. And so the interheart study, so the data at this point suggests that yes, in fact, both in primates and in humans, there's a pretty good relationship between stress and heart disease, that more stress is leading to more heart disease that appears to be a causal process. But anybody who's run any kind of a study knows that you can get significance, but it doesn't really mean anything. Right? So, you know, oh, you know, your scale changed or your outcome and your well-being outcome changed from, you know, 4.6 to 4.67. Right? Is that person really happier at 4.67 than at 4.6? Is that really meaningful? Um, and so the inner heart gives us a chance to look at not only is there an effect, but what's the size of that effect? And if you benchmark it, where does it land relative to other predictors of heart disease? So the inner heart study is this, this global study, uh, seven continents, uh, 29,000 participants, 52 countries. Um, I imagine that was an IRB nightmare. Um, and here's your candidate list of predictors of events. And if you look close, right there, is stress. And they're ordered <laughs> by odds. And what you'll see in that is that, yes, genetics, genetics is number one, way up there, followed by smoking, followed very closely by stress, which happens to be ahead of some things that we consider to be really sort of gold standard predictors of heart disease risk. Things like obesity, high blood pressure, exercise, and the effects of stress are much, much larger than those. And so this is a nice opportunity to really get a, a good idea of, of the magnitude of the effect. Not only is there an effect, but what's the magnitude of that effect? And we see that it's a, it's a fairly large, robust effect. So if, I think if they're measuring 52 different countries, that they used a sort of a, a variety of measures. Um, my sense is that they used um, something like a modified um, uh, perceived stress scale um, as, as their basis. They embedded it in this questionnaire that they could then distribute across languages of others. So like a short form kind of thing. So if we have an effect then, and it's a large effect, what does that do to you? Right, this is a classic black box problem. Right? Maybe it's Harry Potter. Maybe he's got some kind of curse out there. Maybe it's a movie gap again. But maybe it's something measurable. We can ask the question, and it's important to ask the question, about mechanism, because that will help inform interventions. We can oftentimes say, oh, yes, you have this. But an intervention will help target the mechanisms uh, and hopefully lead to better outcomes. Well, there's, there's two ways we can think about this. Um, there's probably more, but I'm, I can only contemplate two. Um, and one of those is that part of the issue is what we call indirect effects. Meaning that, think about your own life. When you're stressed, does it alter your behavior? Do you make the tasty salad? Or do you eat differently? Do you eat what's convenient? Do you, not you, but does somebody you know who has stress, do they drink more alcohol? Does it alter their sleeping behaviors? 
Does it lead to more interpersonal conflict? Um, do you make what we might call unwise life choices uh, under high stress? All those mechanisms are in fact well supported, and not only are they well supported, but the, but the behaviors themselves are then associated with greater disease risk. But they don't account for everything. They, they account for a little bit of it, but not everything. Which leads us then to consider a second option, and that is direct effects. Under stress, the stress, the psychosocial stress, psychological stress, evoke or cause a cascade of physiological events that lead to a downstream outcome, such as greater risk of, of heart disease. And by, by this, we can sort of encapsulate it this way. Sorry, I didn't mean for that hard to beat that fast. Now it's kind of stressful. <laughs> um, but this is sort of embedded as this sort of classic reactivity hypothesis that says uh, larger, longer, and more frequent uh, cardiovascular responses to stress lead to wear and tear on the body, leading to disease. And it sort of sounds like a fair way to make that noise. Um, it, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, if your car is idling too high, right? If your car is idling too high, it's going to produce wear and tear on the car, and it's going to break down eventually. Well, the body's not maybe all that much different. Um, by wear and tear, what we've come to learn, really since maybe 1999, um, is that heart disease is largely an inflammatory disease. Um, meaning that when you get an injury, let's say everybody here has probably had a paper cut at some point in their life. And when you've had those events, um, it's unlikely that you continue to have that, that paper cut right now. Right? Hopefully it's healed up. If it hasn't, go we'll, we'll see a doctor. Um, but if, if it has healed, it probably went through a sort of an acute phase response where maybe it, it, you got some redness, a little swelling, um, and then over time, maybe a little scar or something where it healed up. That's not only an external physical process, but it can be an internal one as well. And the idea is that internal injuries can happen to the body under conditions of sort of turbulence and high blood pressure, um, there's uh, toxins in blood, you can think about nicotine and you can think about other substances, that as those things go careening through the vessels in your body, they can create little endothelial cell injury, little injuries to the lining of the insides of your arteries. And that, when that happens, it begins this inflammation process. And just like on your finger when you got a paper cut, you get an area that becomes a little swollen. You get migration of various aspects of the immune system, including things like lipids that go in there. Pop the area up, the, it's, the dead cells get cleaned out. Um, macrophages come in, uh, white blood cells come in, and then they start to remove things. But if there's high cholesterol in the area, they'll envelop that, and it's possible that they can ingest so much that they can't then back out of the artery. They get stuck in there. And now you have something different. We now have the beginnings of atherosclerosis. Um, that area then gets a little distended, and you'll notice that was what was once a nice wide opening in the artery over here is now narrower. And over time, and by time I mean years and decades, that can progress further and further to the point where you may get a scab, an internal scab, so it's like a, a fibrous cap on that. Um, it can occlude completely, it can get completely blocked up, allowing no blood flow downstream. Little pieces of it can break off and float downstream and get stuck in various parts of the body. If it gets stuck in your pinky, well, you know, you'd be all right. If it gets stuck somewhere more vital, downstream, you know, in, a, in an artery in the heart, uh, in the neck, in the brain, you might have some real problems. Does psychosocial stress contribute to the initiation of that process by creating those original injuries and then leading to some of these events. And it's not only heart-level kinds of reactivity. Increasingly, we're, we're looking at, at systems beyond that. So we do look at what we'll call end organ systems, like blood pressure and heart rate. But we might also look at autonomic systems, um, HRV, parasympathetic functioning, uh, endocrine responses, uh, immune system responses. Each of these are systems are interconnected with different levels of timing based on the stressor itself. If you have an acute stressor, um, anybody here have a sibling? 
feel or imagine. Um, <laughs> all right, and they, they jump out you and scare you, <gasps> right? You get the sudden like change in heart rate. There's no need to suppress your immune system for that, right? You just need enough energy to take care of business and make sure it doesn't happen again. Sometimes though we have longer stresses, stresses that go on for several minutes, maybe even 10, 15 minutes. Like, you know, students around here will tell you about midterms, finals, things like that. Longer stressors. You need more energy for those. And so you then have, you have an endocrine system that helps create energy for that. Then over time, you might have even longer stressors. We can think about sort of critical events like Katrina, um, like Ferguson, and, and these scenarios where stressors are ongoing and longer. Uh, and what we then have is uh, immune systems coming into the process as well. And so stress researchers are increasingly looking at not only individual systems, but a cascade of systems and, and, and clustering of these variables as determinants for a, an increasingly large set of outcomes. It's difficult to wait till somebody has a heart attack to start studying heart disease. So we now look at things with, that we we'll call sort of inflammatory biomarkers, C-reactive protein, indicators that the system is unhealthy and in the process of developing disease. Uh, we look at subclinical disease um, using an ultrasound scan to look at changes in the amount uh, of, of the thickening of those arterial walls where those macrophages are getting stuck with the, with the cholesterol and lipids. Um, we look at atherosclerotic regression. It's hard to say on Friday. Um, atherosclerotic regression uh, is the it, are the are the vessels um, becoming more occluded over time, and so we have procedures for replicability within subjects. Uh, and we still look at, at, at clinical events. Um, you know, it's a bit more challenging because hopefully treatments are getting better. Um, but that's another episode. How we evoke those stress reactions is another part of the evolving stress research process. In the 70s and 80s, there was a lot done around reaction size. A magnitude of reaction was the goal, and so we would have various methods for doing that. Uh, in the 90s, 2000s, we began to model more discrete events as people began to have a more ecological focus in their work. Uh, and today, we're, we're, we're quite interested in uh, looking at daily experiences. And if we take this apart a little bit, we can look and say that, well, these are sort of the, the, the classics. Um, this is really sort of the origins of, of, of real sort of experimental laboratory stresses and health paradigms. Um, they would use these sort of feats of strength kinds of devices where you had to sort of squeeze it and see how long you could hold it and how much pressure. And to do so, you can imagine sort of squeezing something right now. If you made a fist, a tight fist, you'd get a cardiovascular load doing that. Um, some people can have a higher level of load than others, and that was thought to be predictive of, of disease risk. Um, cold pressure tasks. Has anybody ever, ever done one of these? Right? It's a horrible thing. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, some people, some people just can't do it for more than you know a few seconds. Um, you put a bunch of ice in a, uh, a tub, about two, two, uh, two parts water for one part ice. It chills down to about four degrees Celsius. It's very, very cold and painful, um, and, and evokes then a stress response, a physiological response. Uh, and then doing cognitive tasks like um, say the color of the word, not the word itself. So purple, red, black. And you'll find that you'll have a cognitive flow that is also uh, creating a cardiovascular uh, 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 response. This work in particular um, has been very well studied. It's, it's been going on for quite a while. You can look at longitudinal outcomes. Uh, this is a nice paper here. This was in circulation. So really, the sort of top American Heart Association journal on heart disease. Um, and what they found was that uh, in this particular cohort study that Reactions, cardiovascular reactions, blood pressure reactions to uh, a reaction time task. Imagine trying to complete something very quickly. You hit a key as soon as some symbol pops up on your computer. Try to go faster and faster. To the Stroop thing that we just looked at, to mirror tracing, which is kind of like the operation game, and to a memory task. That, that cardiovascular reactions to that um, modestly predicted progression of subclinical disease over a seven year and there's several studies now like this that, that give us some evidence. It's a, it's a pretty good set of findings. It, it, it appears a little weak, uh, the, the, the magnitude of, of the effect. 
but there it is. There's our, for those of you who do this kind of work, there's, there's our history, right? There's the, there's the clay tablet. Does, did this stress any of you today? A lot of you appear to have a stress reaction today, but did this do it? Does anybody have problems with ice buckets today? Just damn, I can't avoid them, they're everywhere. Right. Or was your problem more like this? Somebody else, right? It's not your phone that's stressing you. It's the person who's trying to communicate with you through it. And so this caused a bit of a paradigm shift. People began to say, okay, these, these are working pretty well. We're sort of on the right track. But that's not really what's, what's causing stress. It's not particularly generalizable. It's not particularly ecologically valid. And so a whole new generation of researchers began to come up and, and start to work on more interpersonal paradigms. Um, you can think of people like Tim Smith, uh, Karen Matthews uh, at Pittsburgh, uh, people who adopted the work of like a Harry Stack Sullivan, uh, Timothy Leary, um, when he still used to draw circumflexes and stuff. Uh, and that informed a set of models and theories about how we engage with other people, where stress comes from, and then apply it to the mechanisms that we think are important. So for example, you might, this might be you. You have your personality, everybody has one, right? You have your experiences. You probably do things in a certain way, you like things done in a certain way. Um, and you have your own mood and affect on a given day. And those things together will oftentimes shape how you interact with ambiguous stimuli, like other people. So as you walk across campus, you're going to see other people. You may make eye contact with something. Some days you might smile at them, some days you might not. If you smile at them, right? If you walk down, if, you, if we walk, if we walk down the hall here and find the very next person passing by, and said, hi, do you have a nice friendly smile? Chances are they would smile back at us. We have an impact on their experience. Regardless of who they are, if someone smiles at you, you tend to smile back. Right? So we smile at them, that shapes their experience of us. We must be kind of friendly. Uh, they smile back at us. And in a way, then, having that other person smile back at you might sort of reinforce the good mood that you're already in. Oh, people are so nice, right? The campus, love it here, right? Walk around. If we, though, do something very different, if you go out in the hall and you give an over-behavioral uh, indicator of displeasure, you, you know, you frown at the person that walks by, are they going to smile at you? If somebody did that to you, if some strangers can give you a look, would you smile at them? Or would you look back like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> If you're in a bad mood, <coughs> you frown. If you walk out of your door and don't smile, just or flat or, or frown at other people, you're going to elicit the same sorts of feedback from them, and they, they'll come back to you. And it may reinforce what a terrible, awful place this is uh, to go on that particular day. And you can, some people call that self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, we can call it a transactional process um, that we sometimes shape our own interpersonal experiences. As they respond to us, though, they are now, they have just become the trigger for whether we're going to have a stressor or not. If they frown back at you, now you get into the physiological cascade of things. So this is a series of different kinds of studies. We don't need to go into all of them, but this is effects to, uh, of incentive to exert social influence. Um, the green bars are the, the high incentive group, the blue bars are low. Um, speaking to another person always causes us to have so many activities, it's a little bit of work. But if you're trying hard to influence them, then it creates a larger physiological change. So what we have here is actually, uh, this is systolic blood pressure, uh, this is heart rate, an increase in heart rate, um, this is cardiac output, or the amount of blood that your heart is pushing out, uh, and this is your parasympathetic system, you get a larger withdrawal of the parasympathetic system. And so this is all sort of an orchestrated cardiovascular response, at least on two different, two to three different levels. Uh, you can think about blood pressure, heart rate, and autonomic system different levels. This is a uh, change in wives' blood pressure as a function of interacting with either the red bar, which is a more pessimistic husband, 
or blue bar, which is the more optimistic customer. Um, so you can think about, you know, people in your lives. Um, are they more friendly or more hostile, more optimistic, more pessimistic? Is it more work to try and have a conversation of some substantive issue with a more optimistic versus a more pessimistic other? Probably the more pessimistic one. And it's not only speaking, but listening to that other person who is probably going to be saying more negative things or just trying to engage in a free-for-all discussion creates more cardiovascular flavor. Those are all individual interactions, but what happens on a daily basis, right? We have relationships, and relationships mean that we have frequent contact with other specific people. And if we think about those relationships as generally having a pattern to them, right? You probably have friends out there, and you consistently have the same sorts of interactions with that other person. Some of them are nice, friendly interactions. Uh, with other people, your enemies, you may have more negative kinds of interactions. What is the daily cost of repeated frequent contact with those other people. It's just these repeated little transactions over and over and over. <coughs> Theoretically. Over time, repeated interactions with another person, if the person is more positive, may lead to better health. If they're more negative, may lead to, to worse health. In other words, we can start to ask the question, if we're thinking about other people as being an ecologically valid experience to study from a stress perspective, what are the longitudinal implications of dealing with the more positive versus a negative? Can other people affect your health independent of who you are? So this is a study that sort of addresses that. This is a study of bypass patients and their spouses. Um, in this particular study, I want to say the end was about 120. Um, all the patients were male, uh, spouses were female. And what we find is that uh, over an 18 month period, each person's own personality traits predicted their own depressive symptoms. So people who were more depressed at baseline were more depressed later on, um, both for patients and caregivers. In a given moment, the diet affects one another. And if you've, if you've ever been around another person, you know that another person can lift you up, another person can bring you down in a given moment. And so we see that effect here. And at 18 months, they were pretty well matched on their symptoms. What's interesting, maybe, is this. That the traits of the patient prior to surgery predict the well-being of their partner 18 months later after controlling for the person's own individual characteristics. So you separate their own personality out, their partner's personality continued to predict additional variance in their outcome over that time period. And that went for both patients on their caregivers and caregivers on the patients. And it's true for both positive and negative characteristics. So optimism predicted better well-being over time. Neuroticism, that sort of anxious, worry, concerned personality, predicted more depressive symptoms over time. With a caveat. That marital satisfaction, the relationship quality between the two people, moderated these effects. Meaning that if you have a <coughs> neurotic spouse, this relationship was really valid to the extent that you were not satisfied or satisfied in your marriage. In other words, you might have a spouse, you can say, boy, my spouse is, you know, I love their quirks. But if your relationship quality goes down and you're not so satisfied in your relationship any longer, those same characteristics start to erode your well-being. They start to get to you. That's why it's crazy. You might start to feel yourself saying that. As that research was advancing, there's also an evolution in technology. Where we were once confined to studying these things in a laboratory under control conditions, or more from an epi perspective where you, you watch something but you can't really gauge mechanisms, ambulatory technologies sort of be became mature to the point where it was then useful for stress researchers. 
And this includes portable heart rate monitors. So, do you folks remember when sort of uh, heart rate monitors, like polar watches, became a thing? Right? So, everybody had their polar watch, and you know, you get with the band or without, and everybody sort of had their thing. Pedometers were a thing. Um, everybody walked around with their pedometers. But more sophisticated things, like, like actigraphy, uh, like actical, it's assessing uh, daily activity levels, assessing uh, movement during sleep to gauge quality of sleep uh, and rest. Uh, portable blood pressure monitors, these, these tiny little blood pressure monitors um, that you could just wear on a belt. Um, this person appears to be wearing it completely wrong, um, but whatever. Uh, but there it is, you can wear it under a shirt, it's almost uh, inconspicuous, it's quite, uh, you can barely see it. Um, uh, portable impedance units, so you can look at, at underlying uh, autonomic functioning. Um, we can do cortisol on the road now. You can uh, give a person a pocket full of salivettes, um, little plastic tubes, <coughs> almost like dental cotton uh, inside them, and they can just deposit uh, saliva into it at prescribed times during the day, and you can see diurnal changes in patterns. Uh, and we're now even getting to the point where we can sample blood um, in an ambulatory manner. Um, you think about the technology involved in um, daily uh, sugar monitoring, glucose blood sugar monitoring for diabetics, and you can now sort of apply that same technology um, uh, to stress research to take daily samples of blood um, that can be analyzed in that same way. The great thing about these things is that you can bring individuals in, hook them up with these things, and release them back into their, their daily life. They go back and they do all the things that they would normally do in life. They go out and they, they eat at uh, Wilco. They go to uh, their friend's house. They make up and break up with people. They see strangers and they go to the gym and they do all those things. And you can assess what is their physiology like during the day? Does that have value? Well, um, this is a study uh, by Tom Kmart's group at Pitt. Um, and what they did is they compared, does this ambulatory technology, does it have value? Does it measure up to our classic things? And here's what they found. They found that um, manual clinic blood pressure, right? And they have this stigma manometer up on the wall, and they pump the thing, and they, you know, they get the stethoscope on you, and you measure your blood pressure, that that predicts the amount of uh, thickening in the artery walls, the, the correlation is about 0.14. Not, not great, not too impressive, but there's something there. But that's manual clinic blood pressure when you're sitting on the butcher paper in the doctor's office. Is that, by the way, is that a typical experience for you all, sitting on that piece of paper? Is that really representative of you in daily life? Right? Because they're always telling you, stay calm, don't talk. <laughs> I have kids, that's not a reality for me. It's, it's like a break, actually. It's a, it's a weird moment. Um, automated clinic blood pressure. This is things like Dynamaps and Criticon GE monitors. Um, the things you see on like you know the hospital shows. It's, it's sort of like a big blue unit. A button on it, you just push it. It's a, it's a Velcro cuff, it just goes on, and it measures it. It's an automated blood pressure monitor. Correlation there between blood, that kind of blood pressure in IMT is about 0.23. Much bigger, really nice association. It tells us actually maybe we should question who's doing the first set of blood pressure units because they appear to be off a little bit. Versus ambulatory blood pressure. Strapping one of these little monitors on and letting the person go out and experience daily life. These other ones you're going to get maybe two, maybe two to three samples. This other one, you can sample blood pressure. We do it maybe every 45 minutes um, throughout a person's day. You can aggregate those together. And just like more pixels on your TV, when you go to Best Buy, you want the one with the most, with the biggest number, right? The most pixels, because it gives the best picture. That higher resolution sampling gives you an even better uh, association with disease. It's a superior predictor of who has disease and doesn't. Greater variability during the day, but greater acuity in predicting who is at risk. That's all well and good, that's fantastic. It suggests that maybe people shouldn't be doing manual clinic blood pressure, they should be strapping these little monitors on people, and that, that should be a better surveillance mechanism for figuring out who actually has heart disease or is developing it and greater risk. 
But for stress researchers, the next question then is, what's creating all that daily variability? What's, what's, what is that? What's, what's driving that? So there were additional developments in technology, and this is where experiential sampling comes in. Does anybody here have uh, familiarity with this or do any of this kind of work? Right, so, so experiential sampling. We can think about, um, so the classic is ecological momentary assessment. Uh, this used to be the case where we would send people out with watches with a little alarm on it, and the little alarm would go off and you'd pull out like a paper diary and write down what they were doing. Now it's all phone based. Um, you have a little app on your phone, the app comes to life and asks you a series of questions. You know, how stressed are you on a scale of zero to 10? You know, what are your feelings? And it'll list a bunch of feelings that you just sort of pick and choose. It takes, you know, 30 to 45 seconds and it goes to sleep for the next hour. You can pair that with physiological recording equipment to get a sort of a yoked experience of what the physiology looked like and what the self report is. There's also things like ambient sound capture uh, approaches. So Matthias Mingle over in psychology does a lot of this, the ear, um, which is just a random sampling recording device. It captures bits of sound when encoded. And you can tell where was the person, what were they doing? Were they engaging with other people? How did they sound? What kinds of words were they using? You know, were they using stress words? Were they using you know, happy words, that kind of thing. There's increasingly use of uh, visual capture equipment, um, little portable cameras, GoPros, things like that that can capture pictures of where the person was and what they were looking at. Uh, and finally, GPS is, is starting to come online. People are now using GPS to assess what kinds of places are people going to. You know, were they really at work? Were they, you know, in a good or bad neighborhood? You know, and where, does where you go during the day, the social environment, does that have any association? So this is a really sort of exciting time because all these technological advances are coming around and as you might expect, they're allowing us to then really take a look at some of the theories we've had for a long time, like that little picture of the little cascading transactions. What we find is that this data is suggesting that, in fact, this ecological approach to studying people in social environments is right, that people actually spend about 60% of their day around other people, so that was good. There's no ice buckets involved. Nobody's stepping into ice buckets, so that was a good move to move away from that. But one problem is that we're not finding that people really fight all that much. And so where our lab paradigms have been debate tasks, <coughs> arguments, things like that, yes, we're, we're interacting with other people, we're just not modeling the correct interactions. And this is now sort of influencing where we're going to go. So we're in the daily experience realm, but this middle part now seems to be an old conception that we're starting to move away from. People do have interactions, negative interactions, but they seem to be the rare endpoint to a broader set of stress-related psychosocial processes. And you can think about it like this. Let's say this is your boss. We've all had a boss before. Let's say this is your boss. Um, your boss tells you that report you did, it's not your best report. Do you fight with them? Probably not, because then they're not your boss anymore because you lost your job. Um, so you probably don't fight with them. Or if you do fight with them, that's going to just create a whole bunch of new stuff. You might do a couple of other things. You might just passively let it go. Right? Maybe they're just in a bad mood. Just let it go. Right? Why create a thing out of a thing? It's not, it's not that big a deal. Let it go. But while they're around you, you might watch them. You might keep an eye on them. And you might get stressed as they come closer to you. And you might relax a little bit as they go away. But you keep an eye on them and watch them. And afterwards, later in the day, you may sit around and think about your interactions with them. So increasingly, increasingly we think about now that yes, we do have these negative interactions, but we spend a far larger time being vigilant for those that we could potentially have an interaction with. And when something does happen, we tend to watch them prudently to see if something greater develops and if there is a need for a conflict. But you only engage in conflict really as a sort of a last resort. And after, we oftentimes sit around and ruminate about these things. And this is very much like what Cannon was saying between sort of these overt clear experiences and more imagined kinds of experiences. 
that imagining experiences can also cause reactions. You can think about the last time you were angry. Sometimes when you're driving, I'm sure you probably sort of zone out and you think about something that happened in your day. You might find yourself becoming upset. This larger captures, larger conceptualization probably better captures what stress is more actually like for us. And fortunately, we're in a time now when we can measure this. So much of my current work is, is, is in this area. It's, it's, it's looking at this idea of vigilance. Um, and I think of vigilance as being an, an effortful process, put effort into this, trying to monitor and understand your surroundings. And that as you get that information, as you take that information in, it has a physiological set of consequences that may be important for your heart disease risk. People might be vigilant for any number of reasons. You might live in an environment where there's chalk outlines and you have to be vigilant. But you can think about if last time you, you know, walk to your car at night by yourself and if you see another person, you pay more attention to them than you would if you were in a large crowd of people. We have some social roles that require us to be more vigilant. Um, if you're a caregiver for somebody, you have to watch for them and watch for danger. That's your, that's your job. If you have children, it's pretty much the same kind of thing. You have to be watchful of them. Um, you enjoy it, but you want, you're also careful that they avoid um, harm. Um, certain occupations, if you're in the military, if you're a police officer, your whole job is to be vigilant and look for the dangers out there. And we get individual differences. More negative, more hostile people are more likely to engage in this kind of thing because of the sort of the suspicious nature of their personality, the way they sort of view the world. I have spent the better part of the last six years coming up with this slide. Um, it's funny, it's just one slide, but it's like six years of work. Um, uh, this essentially is the measure that we've now created uh, to, to assess this construct. There weren't any real measures of, of vigilance. It's very behaviorally defined, and we came up um, through a series of item pools, uh, large samples, I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood of about, um, uh, this is a final model, it's got about 3,200 participants. Um, that we came up with three basic kinds of vigilance. Um, there's vigilance for threats, looking for potential problems in your environment or watching them. Um, uh, vigilance of yourself, sometimes we watch ourselves in a certain environment, get nervous, how can we call it? You want to look at and check yourself. Um, and vigilance for others' reactions to you. Um, I've been doing this for the better part of the last hour, uh, <laughs> watching you all to see what you think of things. And you know, people like this, please, my, my heart rate goes up. <laughs> it's important to know when you're, when you're creating a measure like this that you're not simply reinventing the wheel. The natural wheel, by comparison, for vigilance might be neuroticism. So we evaluated whether that, in fact, is a thing, and what we find is that it's really not. Um, we're tapping something that seems to be related to neuroticism, but it's, it's, it's a fairly modest relationship. We're clearly not talking about the same exact thing. Um, our measure of vigilance is associated positively with all the characteristics that we currently associate with heart disease risk. Hostility, anger, anxiety, uh, all the negative aspects. It's inversely associated with optimism, with higher levels of social support, with trait happiness. Uh, we can do eye tracking studies. Do people who report being more vigilant, they actually then look at things in a manner that you would think to be uh, uh, consistent with that. So we present them with happy faces, uh, angry faces, and sad faces. And sure enough, the various domains of, of vigilance are associated with these kinds of, of visual cues in the directions expected. We can look at clinical populations. This is a small study of 30 people who had been hospitalized for their first MI. We assessed them uh, in the hospital within one to three days of the actual event. Uh, and what we see is that people who report higher levels of vigilance are also reporting more sort of impact of event scale symptoms of the event. In other words, they were more traumatized. So uh, higher vigilance is associated with a greater sort of sensitivity to these kinds of events. We've done other studies where we've demonstrated that it's moderated by individual differences, by social environments that are more negative, um, uh, that it, uh, it's in the laboratory paradigms it's associated with larger responses uh, in terms of blood pressure, um, and that 
if you give somebody an opportunity to be vigilant for a threat, and then you have them actively engage with that threat, that it potentiates their reactions to that subsequent interaction. In other words, it's sort of getting just what you actually want vigilance to do. It gets them prepared for an engagement, and when they do engage, they do it in a more robust way than those who didn't have that opportunity. Um, and that leads us to our current work, which is, is it associated with disease? And so, just this last week, I had my investigators here. We have something that we call the North uh, Texas Heart Study. Uh, it's a study um, run in Denton County, Texas, which is just outside of Dallas. Uh, this is funded by, um, through OpNet uh, at NIH. Um, and our aims are to look at whether vigilance is associated with disease. I won't take you through that. But I will say that we started with 300 participants, 150 men, 150 women. They were stratified by age, from age 21 to 70. Uh, we had some degree of diversity within the sample. Um, we did some EMA work with them. We, we, we strapped monitors onto them and released them out there. And these are all community dwelling people. 60% um, uh, of the EMA entries, and there were some uh, 8,000 uh, EMA entries uh, over the course of the, the, the baseline two-day study period um, involved interacting with other people, and half of those involved a degree of vigilance. So it tells us that not only is, are people engaging in the social environment, but when they do engage in the social environment, that this vigilance construct is coming up. That it's not a rare event. In fact, it seems to be a, a basic behavioral uh, that vigilance is associated with higher vigilance associated with having a more negative day, um, with having uh, less quality sleep. And when we look at disease, this is a very, very preliminary data right here. Um, we did carotid artery scans and looked at what's happening in the carotid arteries around the neck. It's just easier to image, and it's the same disease process happening in the heart. Um, what we see is that higher age, uh, being male, and that vigilance for other people's reactions, the sensitivity to how others see you, is associated with higher disease uh, in those artery segments. Beyond all this, I think we have a pretty good picture at this point that this relationship is fairly robust that, and getting better at measuring it in a more ecologically valid way. At some point, we're going to start to spend more time doing a sort of a Grand Canyon approach to this kind of work. In other words, not only broad, but deep as well. And by deep, I mean understanding the higher order neural mechanisms that influence this process, as well as just looking at the downstream disease consequences. Um, we're going to need to spend more time looking at uh, surveillance efforts and feeding this into public health models to better identify people who are at risk. If your risk factor is on par with smoking, then you should perhaps be asking about stress in the screening process. And finally, I think it opens the door to lots of different intervention opportunities that are both cognitive behavioral as well as pharmacological. And I think I'll stop there. I'll just sort of thank my, my various investigators um, who are sort of all over the place as well as the And Thank you very much for having me here today. Appreciate it. mentioned on one of your slides that vigilance was associated with certain stress physiology patterns, but you didn't say what that was. I was curious what that looked like. Um, so vigilance is, is essentially a sensory intake process. There's these classic studies of uh, sort of dot pro matrices and whatnot, and it very much looks like that. It, it evokes a very vascular kind of response. Um, so you see increases in diastolic blood pressure, a very little change in heart rate but an increase in diastolic blood pressure, resting blood pressure, um, uh, and in total peripheral resistance, uh, for example. Uh, we have uh, two papers that are in the process right now showing links with uh, biomarkers like uh, high, sensitivity, high sensitivity CRP. Um, I, I don't recall if we've looked at the IL-6 data yet, um, but that seems to be the sort of emergent thing. But it's a sort of a chronic heightened blood pressure response. I don't know if that answers your question. I guess I'm not sure if you're referring to individual differences in vigilance or at the moment when someone is having a vigilant response. We see it, these are 
we see it both ways. So in other words, um, in a laboratory manipulation where we have an experimental manipulation of visual subjectivity, right, we, we do these studies where we tell a, a person um, you're going to engage in a debate task. Um, before that, you're going to get to watch a video of another person. Half of them are told that that person is the person they're going to debate. So in other words, a relevant target. The other half are told is just some random person who's practicing for another thing, but you see what people look like on okay. camera. Um, and so the first one, the relevant condition, is considered the high vigilance. And sure enough, when people get that signal, regardless of the individual difference variable, they show this, this vascular response pattern, um, much more pronounced than, than the other patterns. Um, and then when they do go on to then engage in the debate, they have a, essentially a potentiated response, a much larger, also all-encompassing cardiovascular response during the subsequent interactions. The individual difference characteristic also shows a generally higher vascular response regardless of condition. So in other words, like a main effect. When you put the two of them together, you can get an interaction um, where the individual difference plus a relevant stimuli creates a little bit larger vascular response, a potentiated sensible response. And then they're more likely to then go on to have a poor recovery in the, say, 15 minutes after the event is over. They continue to have an elevated blood pressure response for a longer period of time. It takes them longer to get back to a baseline. I was thinking about some research that I know about that today Lewis is doing, mm -hmm. uh, who is at Emory University, mm -hmm. and she's uh, studying um, you know, perceptions of racial bias and discrimination that may be subtle. So right. maybe a good examination of the example of being vigilant and then finding you know, some right. offensive and then reacting and ruminating. The, the Tanae stuff is interesting. It's, I'm not clear that it's necessarily vigilance at play. She's not measuring in a mechanism yet. Okay. Um, she's showing it's almost more like perceived stress or anticipation of a stressor. Um, a little bit. The difference between the vigilance. Uh, I, th I think that I think it's uh, it's it's. I'm not sure what stimuli they're taking in. You know, so if, for example, if I if you were to think, well, okay, you're going to debate this other, you know, champion debater. In ten minutes, and then I left you sit. Let you sit in the room. You might have a heightened response to that, but you're not particularly looking at anything. It's it's an anticipation. It's a more of a cognitive, maybe rehearsal, versus sort of the way I've been conceptualizing vigilance, which is more of an active behavioral process. In other words, you can you can see the stimuli. There's a stimuli to directly be to be directly monitored, and I just don't know enough about today's work to know whether she's presenting them with the stimuli, or whether it's more of an anticipatory process. But I think ultimately we're coming to studies. the same, I think ultimately we're coming to the same point, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's at least planning to do some ambulatory studies in the field, mm -hmm. and then looking at cardiovascular response when they encounter yeah. experiences of this kind, so they're going to be on the lookout for it, and then it'll happen. Yeah. And well, I'm pretty sure she's embedded this measure now into those studies. So we'll see that if that sort of plays out. And we do, we put it in, it's a 10 item measure, we simply change the stem and we validated it as an acute in the moment measure as well. Um, and so we get good correspondence between the survey measure and the in the moment EMA measure. Um, so it should be right there. Right there. So we do have a little bit of data on that. Um, so we use some what people call circumflex measures. We behavior is measured essentially on, depending on who's model we're using, um, on, on two axes. You have an affiliation axis, how friendly to hostile is your is the tone of your behavior, versus a uh, essentially a dominance or control axis, how dominant to submissive is your behavior. Um, vigilance tends to be more sort of you might, almost, you might almost characterize it as passive aggressive. Very, very quiet, very passive, and essentially a monitoring process, not trying to influence anything necessarily. 
sort of taking it all in, but doing so in a very sort of a negative kind of way, expecting there to be a problem. Um, and so when you, if you sort of think about those axes as being sort of orthogonal, uh, it'd be in sort of your quadrant number three, right down near the bottom, sort of in that possible submissive uh, area. Um, there's a new paper that will be coming out in, I think it's April, in Health Psych. Um, uh, Tim Smith and Jenny Kunduf have just done a, a really nice uh, manipulation of social status differences um, and many of the variables that we are looking at here. So you might want to check that out. That's, that's on the next I would say two things to that. One, um, there is an element of vigilance that is adaptive. It's important to sort of watch your environment. Um, so in some ways, you can sort of see it like stress in general. It's important to, be, to have stress as an emotion, to motivate you to do something, to take action when the goal is in So in that way, stress, uh, vigilance can have positive properties. What I didn't talk about at all in this talk is, is the, the, the factors that seem to buffer stress. Or be are, are protective against the effects of stress, um, and and one place that I do look at that in my own work, um, if you sort of asked me the last six years, is in, in Hispanic samples uh, in, in Latino health, where there's a lot of uh, psychosocial, socioeconomic disparities, yet very very positive cardiovascular outcomes, and there's a great paper uh, meta analysis in PLOS one I think. Um, by Julianne Volt Lundstad at, at BYU, and she's essentially, it's a meta-analysis of studies, and she benchmarks it at the end, um, but she's showing the protective effects of social integration, essentially sort of communal coping uh, approaches, um, and those effects on mortality. It's a very, very robust, strong effect. And so I think one of the things that you see is that you can have stress, but if you have some of these other offsetting properties, um, that they can they can counteract those effects, and I think what that means that means two things. One, one it means that we need to sort of pay more attention to resilience factors, uh, and two, we need models um, that incorporate resilience along with risk. And it's essentially it's almost like trying to to write checks on your checkbook, but you're only doing debits, you're never doing credits, and so you're never going to be exactly right. You're going to have some error in there, uh, and I think you have to have those pieces. And I think as a field, that's that's one of the places we need to go uh, is to build those better. Uh, I guess you might expect the, the uh, say, the term transporter allele, the S allele, perhaps to play a role in this as well, because sometimes those uh, people with, with that allele are described as being more, more vigilant, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially for social cues. Right. So, uh, and that's as much part of the epigenetic component, perhaps, that you were talking about at the beginning. Right. Yeah, I think, I think now that we have a, I feel pretty good about our measurement strategy at this point. Um, and now I think that as we have that, um, I mentioned the Grand Canyon thing earlier, so you, you, can go, you, can, you can go deep, but you can go wide also. Um, by deep, I mean, I think now we can look at what are some of the other basic biobehavioral mechanisms that may contribute to these things. Um, and when I say why, I mean, we can then start to, to, to look at it as a relevant construct to at-risk populations. So in health disparities, in, you know, in socioeconomic uh, and sort of populations, uh, and, and apply it to these different kinds of settings. So, so let's see. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. It was very nice to meet you.